This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. This is Creature Comforts from MPB Think Radio. It's the show all about your animals and the animals around you. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major, veterinarian at the Animal Medical Center in Jackson, and Libby Hartfield, retired director of the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science. Today we welcome back one of the good friends of our show, Dr. Kathy Shropshire. When she's not portraying the heroine Fanny Cook on stage, she's staying in tune with Mississippi's great outdoors. So today we'll hear about some of the small mammals around the state, like weasels and minks. Dr. Major and Libby are ready for pet and creature questions as well. So to join, call our program. The number is 1-877-MPB-RING. It's 1-877-672-7464. You can email animals at mpbonline.org. Always like to remind you that if you miss Creature Comforts on Thursday morning, it repeats every Saturday morning at 6. So good morning, uh, Libby. The other day when I was taking my walk, I heard the chorus frogs. That was exciting to me. Uh, what's going on there in Oregon? Good morning, Kevin. Uh, other than that it's so dark right now, I'm not used to the daylight savings <laughs> time change. Um, I have western bluebirds. I feel like we picked up the conversation right where we left it last Thursday morning. Mm-hmm. So many callers about bluebirds. And um We've been watching a couple of male western bluebirds. We've got three houses in the backyard, and uh, they're getting ready. You know, it's all about the property with bluebirds. They um, they take well to nesting boxes, but I'm sure they did a similar kind of behavior back when they were depending on cavities and trees, and wilder birds still have to do that. So that's a a reason to leave old trees standing. If it's in a place that's not going to hurt anything, not going to fall on anybody's car or structure, it's a good idea to leave an old tree that's got knot holes in it because so many birds and insects enjoy those trees and um, really need them for nesting cavities. But anyway, bluebirds are dependent on a cavity to nest in. They've got that cute little beak that perfect for catching insects, and um, they can't build their own cavity. They've got to find a hole in a tree that suits them. And uh, the male picks out his territory and his um, nesting box, in my occasion, whatever, if you've got a nesting box out, he'll claim it and um, go in and out and show off a little bit and dance around. And when a female shows up, then they inspect the houses or the holes in the trees, the cavities, and um, pick a mate that way. So it's it's kind of about, um, sounds a little materialistic, but I guess that's no more, uh, it's probably a a sounder way to pick a mate than on strictly on his good looks or his singing ability, which a lot of birds do. Uh, This is Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. I have an email here. Dr. Major, this is a cat email, and it says, My cat's been in great health with no health issues for 16 years we've had her. Three months ago, her behavior changed. She began meowing in the middle of the night. Uh, I would call to her, but she would continue. I would have to get up and go to her and pet her to comfort her. Now she does it throughout the day. Also, it appears she has difficulty hearing. For example, in the past, when I would say treat time, she would immediately respond. Now, if she responds, it takes several seconds with prompts. She still uses litter appropriately, and her appetite is excellent. Uh, I took her to the vet. They did a complete workup with urinalysis and blood work, and all was normal. They had no suggestions for her behavior. What do you suggest I do to make her more comfortable? And me, too. She wakes up during the night and follows me around during the day, meowing as if in distress. Thanks for any suggestions. Wow, that's that's a great uh, great question, and it seems like they've gone you know through the basics as far as getting the blood work done and vet check. I would question a 16 year old cat possibly is hurting somewhere, possibly having some arthritis. That could cause some of the things that they're seeing. The other thing would be uh, a certain degree of senility. I mean, it does happen in cats and in and in dogs. Uh, and people. But I guess the question is, you know, what to do to change things. Uh, Maybe uh, keep her in a little smaller area, try to give her things to do. Uh, I don't know if she's capable of playing at this point, but I suspect possibly arthritis. This does seem to be a 
a trend uh, with the cats, especially at this age, 15, 18. And we see a lot of cats in the 17, 18-year-old range. So I'd pursue it a little bit further. As far as anything to change her uh, attitude, I don't know that they can. But if she's hurting, uh, certainly some medication that could be used. Um, and might it be a better idea as our pets get older to maybe stay a little bit uh, closer uh, um, to, with the vet, maybe you know more frequent uh, visits or consultations with the vet? Yes. Anytime after uh, cats and dogs get into the eight to ten year range, it's wise to have you know a basic blood panel done so you'll have some uh, uh, guidelines in the future. Uh, it gives you a a line that you can see how it was then. Uh, but yes, a little bit, uh, a geriatric consultation is very important for a lot of these older cats, especially. And uh, there, there are other things that uh, blood work might miss. So I'd continue to talk with your veterinarian about this and see uh, if there are any suggestions. All right, here is another email. This one says, question about my healer, age three. Sometimes in the morning she wakes up throwing up yellow or whitish foam. She hasn't eaten anything. Uh, any ideas? Oh, I'm sorry. It says she hasn't eaten anything she shouldn't have. I, that's, I'm sorry, I misread that. Okay, I understand. So this is something that happens in the morning. It sounds like probably uh, this dog has an empty stomach. The yellow uh, color usually relates to bile which would be in the in the stomach at that time uh there may be some sort of reflux going on with this dog uh where uh and they can have reflux uh i would suggest that yes uh this would be one of those cases where she needs to get in or he he needs to get in and uh, be checked uh simply just from the standpoint of this is not normal especially if this is happening every day if it happens once in a while, probably not a big deal. But if it's very regular, I'd say, yes, you need to be checked out. All right. We have uh, one final email here to share. Uh, share. Let me know. Last week we talked about the Joro spider and then more about the common golden orb weaver. Uh, we got this email that says we live in Smith County and last summer had an estimated 10 to 12 of these very large spiders take up residence in our yard. We've noticed the presence since 2018, although not in such numbers. The females look quite intimidating. The males look tiny next to them, but we simply removed the web when it was in an inconvenient place. Your show gives great pleasure and information to many. So... Um, so are the uh, the female golden orb weavers uh, much bigger than the, their male counterparts? Oh, yes, much bigger. And almost all spiders, tarantulas is the only thing I can think of at this moment that the male is is actually the bigger of the two. But the female is, um, she the, the web is generally hers and everything, and he kind of lives along the edges there, and he's, Frankly, he's just there to, to mate with the female, and uh, sometimes, occasionally, they do um, bite his head off. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, you get around that. So he's very careful, and he has to make he has to time things exactly right. Um, yeah, that's a fate no male spider would want, I think. <laughs> yeah, that's just something we don't talk about a lot in biology, I guess. But, uh, yeah, the, the female spider can be vicious. <laughs> Uh, so, Dr. Major, talking about insects, uh, what types of dangers do they pose to pets? Spring is here, brings more outside activities, maybe uh, bees, wasps, ticks, mosquitoes. Uh, what do we need to concern ourselves with when it comes to insects and our pets? You know, let's think about the fact that, you know, a lot of our pets are outside a good bit during the uh, nice weather and everything that we have, and they're, they're subject. We, we walk out and maybe get bitten by a mosquito or uh something like that and in reality they're exposed maybe for hours to both mosquitoes uh fleas and ticks uh usually the spiders are not that big a deal as far as a bite that it might uh, give to a dog uh certainly uh there are cases of brown recluse uh biting you know a dog but that can be an issue I would say that we need to be very aware of the flea and tick control. Uh, <clears throat> ticks especially can spread various diseases such as Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, 
ehrlichia, Lyme disease, uh, and can be and can cause some serious problems. Uh, and of course, fleas. And they're everywhere. <laughs> I guess it's the best way to say that. So you need to really control those in your inside and outside pets. Uh, as far as other things, you know, snakes are a little bit more abundant, and dogs and cats both are curious, and they uh, certainly stand a chance of getting bitten. Be frank, quite frank with you, we don't see that many snake bites, but they are uh, certainly possible. And we've talked about before about keeping vegetation kind of cleared out, um, especially along fence lines and this sort of thing where uh, uh, snakes might populate. And But dogs are very, very curious, and they usually get bitten either on the paw or the nose. Cats are a little bit more adroit or adept, and they usually avoid getting bitten, but cats can be bitten as well. Um, and just uh, we talked about flea and tick control, and I would imagine there are enough different sorts of uh, products, control products, that uh, any pet owner should be able to find something that, that seems to work well for their particular dog or cat. Right, and th- one of the main things is to use as directed and uh, directions are on all of that. One of the big problems, of course, is uh, if you happen to use something that's designed for dogs on a cat or and that sort of thing, and certainly you can cause some problems uh so be very careful with the directions and there's a whole host of different types of flea and tick medications that can be used uh so use what works for you this is creature comforts time for our first break of the hour when we come back we'll talk about weasels minks and other small mammals found around the state with wildlife biologist dr kathy shropshire also if you have a pet question dr major is here to help call with questions and comments the phone number it's one eight seven seven. MPB Ring. It's 1 877 672 7464. Email animals at mpbonline.org. Back with more, so stay tuned. Hi, I'm Jason Klein from Fix It 101. If you ever thought about changing the doorknob or fixing a leaky faucet, some jobs just aren't that difficult, and yes, you can do it. If you want to find out how to do those things, listen to Fix It 101, podcast everywhere. We're back on Creature Comforts. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major and Libby Hartfield. Today we're in studio, our guest, wildlife biologist, Dr. Kathy Shropshire. If you want to join the conversation with question or comment, the number to call is 1-877-MPB-RING. It's 1-877-672-7464. You can email animals at mpbonline.org. So, Kathy, welcome back. Always good to have you on the show. For those who might not be familiar with you, uh, tell us a little bit about your background and how you developed an interest in the outdoors. Well, I developed an interest in the outdoors when I was young and lived in the country, and uh, my parents fed me uh, information and made sure that I learned about the outdoors and the animals and um, took that to get a biology degree and um, worked for the Department of Wildlife Issues and Parks and retired from there and um, worked at the museum and also in the game division while I was there and then uh, retired from there and worked at the Mississippi uh, Wildlife Federation for a number of years and so now I'm free. <laughs> free at last. <laughs> So in the opener, we mentioned uh, that before the pandemic, one thing that you were known for was portraying Fanny Cook. Uh, and I think it's always important for people who might not know about her to, you know, to make people more aware of her. So if you would tell us a little bit about who Fanny Cook was and the impact she had on Mississippi wildlife. Um, Fanny Cook was born in the late 1800s. And um, in the 1920s, she realized that in Mississippi, we were losing a lot of wildlife and a lot of habitat. And she made it her job in life to protect that wildlife. And she thought the best way to do that would be to um, get legislation to create a Department of Wildlife. At that time, the state did not have one, and all the other states did. So um, she worked tirelessly to get the Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks established to help protect wildlife. And she went on to establish the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science. 
So when you're talking about small mammals today, uh, beginning with the weasel, um, first of all, this is an odd question, but, you know, <laughs> we think about, oh, you weasel. Do we know how this poor creature got such a bad reputation? <laughs> well, it, yeah, uh, not exactly. I mean, there's a lot of, of places where the name could come from, from different languages, and it means different things. In some, most cases, it meant they were more, um, maybe not aggressive, but tenacious, that sort of thing. The words, not not weaselly. <laughs> that was not <laughs> where it came from. I don't, I'm not sure unless it means, you know, they are secretive and they do... Um, you know, I, I'm not sure where where weasel came from. That may not even have come from that animal. It might have come from somewhere else. <laughs> so, um, do we have a lot of weasels in Mississippi, and what what role do they play in, in Mississippi's wildlife? Um, weasels are carnivores. They are in the same group as skunks. I know you talked about skunks last week, so um, it's in the same group, uh, mustelids, and um, so they control. Um, well, their um, food is mostly mice and rabbits, rats, squirrels, chipmunks, um, shrews, moles, those kinds of things. So they're, you know, helping con- to control those kinds of animals in the uh, habitat. And they're very secretive. When I uh, mentioned to somebody that I was going to do this show and talk about minks and weasels, they, they, their response was minks and weasels. <laughs> I was like, yeah, you know, <laughs> like me. <laughs> no, right, really. So they are extremely secretive. And probably in Mississippi, most of what we know about abundance or that sort of thing is from trapper reports from the years ago. They were trapped. They're fur bearer. And so they were trapped. And we could, over the years, see the decline in the numbers of animals that were trapped. And that often indicates a reduction in the number of animals. Um, in Mississippi, and for me, I've seen two in the, I've been here since the late 70s, and I've seen two weasels in my career. And both of them were fairly near my home, within a mile of my home. They were both unfortunately dead at the time. So they are extremely secretive. Um, when I started kind of looking back to refresh my memory, um, uh, George Lowry, who was the mammalogist in Louisiana, wrote The Mammals of Louisiana. And he also, that book was printed in the late 70s, I guess. And he mentioned that for his 50 years of research, he had only seen two. Hmm. So they're extremely um, secretive and probably not as abundant as some other carnivores might be. Uh, what about appearance? How big are weasels? What do they look like? Well, they're um, maybe 16 inches. Um, males are slightly bigger than females. Um, females might be 12 to 13 inches. But they're kind of wiry little guys. They're only about 7 ounces for the males and 3 ounces for the um, females. So they're extremely small. They're um, den um, d- burrows that they use are, you know, like maybe three inches in diameter. So they're extremely wiry little critters. <laughs> we'll be visiting with Kathy throughout the hour. We do have some phone calls on the line, so let's uh, invite some listeners into the conversation, starting with Chester from Vicksburg. Good morning, Chester. You're on the air with us. Chester. Good morning. This is Chester Martin. Uh, I just wanted to remind everybody that next week, next Thursday, uh, March the 24th from 9 to 4 p.m., we're having the 20th anniversary meeting of the Mississippi Bat Working Group meeting in the environmental classroom there at the museum. And we'll be having a number of presentations, door prizes, photo contests, art exhibit. So everybody is welcome to come and learn about bats. All right. So, again, that's next Thursday. What time next, does it start again? Nine o'clock. At the, the, uh, at the at, Museum of Natural Science? Right. In the environmental classroom. All right. Chester, thanks for the heads up. We appreciate you calling in this morning. Okay, thank you. Let's move on next, going to Tupelo, our friend Terry on the line. Good morning, Terry. Go ahead. Good morning. I'm going to, uh, if it's okay, because I happen to be in northern Minnesota mm-hmm. last, uh, it's been probably three or four months, and Martins, not the bird, they're part of the, I think they're part of the weasel or minx family, but they're much bigger than I thought they were, and uh, they inhabit a lot of the northern hemisphere, uh, and I was just curious if she could speak to Martins. No, but they are. 
<laughs> no, they don't occur in Mississippi, so I'm really not that familiar with them. But you, I, but I do know, like you said, they are um, a bit bigger than the the mink that we have here, and. Um, kind of fill some of the same niches up there but you know unfortunately i'm sorry i can't i really can't provide you much insight on that they were all i can say is they were very cool looking i was at a nature preserve uh, they were very very cool right. looking and bigger than i thought yeah yeah you know all of those animals like that are so sleek and so um fluid and so graceful you know otters are just amazing animals and uh you know i think i would like to come back as an otter because they seem to have so much fun and they're so graceful <laughs> all right Terry. Well, speaking of otter i had i had a friend on pickwick that actually saw a family of white otters oh wow oh, hmm. wow i mean yeah that I, could have seen those, and I have a picture i'm going to email it to you guys so you guys can see the picture of them moving around and oh wow on the bank. yeah yeah oh, that would be great thank you Thanks, Terry, for your call. And that uh, might, uh, if someone is interested, uh, like Terry and Martins, you could do a little search online and, and find out a little bit more about those. Uh, next, it's off to Beaumont. Sue is on the line. Good morning, Sue. You're on the air with us. Good morning. I think she's already answered my question, but I'd like to, <clears throat> excuse me, I'd like to ask two questions, if I may. The first one is, uh, do you think global warming is causing the stoats and all the other critters to come down to south, further south? Is that what it is? Because I was born and raised in Mississippi. I've never seen uh, that, any of those creatures, weasels or anything like that. Um, they've been here historically. That you know, two million years ago or so, they kind of. Um were, were first in, in um, Canada. They came over the Bering Strait and, and came down, moved this way. But it, they've been here for, you know, thousands of years. So it's not anything that's happened from climate change. Okay. Can I ask you another question? Sure. <laughs> this, this may not be apropos to the subject today, but I'm dying with curiosity. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I'm here. I don't have Internet service because I live too far out in the boondocks and et, et cetera and so forth. So I have to call uh, creature comforts a lot. But anyway, <laughs> excuse me. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, somebody on Facebook was asking about, <laughs> this is how, how tight my life is. Somebody was asking about um, how was uh, amber formed. And I thought everybody knew how amber was formed. And so I wrote that it's because an insect got stuck in the sticky sap of a tree and then without it being able to move more sap, just oozed over and it, it hardened in amber over millions of years. But is that is that correct? Everybody says what? <laughs> I could never heard of that before. I think that's correct. Yeah, yeah Libby, is that? That's that's the way I've pretty much heard it too. Yeah. yeah. If they've seen Jurassic Park, they should know that. <laughs> <laughs> and there have been an awful opportunities to right. see Jurassic Park. <laughs> At least one. <laughs> because yeah. the most valuable treasure on Earth, they say, it, it was the Amber Room that was somewhere in the Russian palace. Mm. And it, it got sunk. Uh, it was sunk on a ship. Oh, wow. Mm. During World War II, they removed the Amber Room. They took all the panels out. And I didn't know it was worth millions and millions of dollars, you know. Oh, really? Oh, well, that's, that can make a great treasure hunt movie, couldn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, Sue, good to hear from you this morning. This is Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. We're visiting today with wildlife biologist Dr. Kathy Shropshire, talking a little bit uh, to begin the show about weasels. Um, so, again, I guess this is um, – I was wondering if they were a nuisance around your home, but if they're so secretive no one ever sees them, maybe not a lot of that problem. No, I, I wouldn't think – you know, I haven't seen anything uh, read, anything that would make – now <laughs> – and you don't see this much anymore, but as, gr- as I was growing up, and we didn't have chickens, but that was one of the things that just repeatedly in literature came up is how, how hard weasels could be on chickens um, in getting into the coops, probably because they're so small. And they will. They're pretty aggressive or tenacious or whatever, so they can take prey that is much bigger than they are Mm -hmm. and um but you don't read that but maybe it's because people don't have chickens like they used to and they're not in those you know out of the way places and farms that um have a lot of habitat around them now people have chickens but they have them in the backyard in the urban setting and maybe that's that's why we don't hear but but um that was apparently at some time (laughs) was quite uh, an impact on people 
You know, one thing I think that's interesting when we talk about mating is that, you know, some creatures have small one or two offspring and others have large amounts or whatever. Where does the weasel fit in on that uh, scale? Uh, well, weasel, this is kind of interesting is they mate in um, the spring, but in the sperm and the um, egg um, may uh, come together, but it's not implanted until the spring. And then a month later is when the young are born. So it, this is almost a year from the time they originally mate before the before the young are born. Hmm. And they're, um, you know, five or you know, so young. They can have more. But I think one those things when they, when you can have those um, litters that are kind of exorbitant, exorbitant, it's when the habitat's been really good and they can have more young it's not it's not a normal thing it's one of those yeah it can happen the sort of things so. and are they one of them kick them out of the nest type things early on well you know <laughs> two or three months later and then the the females are ready to breed <laughs> shortly after so you know they can keep that uh, small population going um so we're going to transition our conversation after this break to the mink any final weasel thoughts Weasel thoughts. Let's see. Um, I can't think of anything. They they do have a, a like a maybe I said high metabolic rate, so they have to eat. They'll eat forty percent of their weight in a day, so they have to be out hunting quite a bit. That's probably why the chickens were in danger. <laughs> the chickens were in danger. <laughs> there they were, all tied up, waiting for them. <laughs> We have to take another break. When we get back, we'll continue talking with our guest, Kathy Shropshire. As I said, we'll move on and talk a little bit about minks. Also, John's on the line with a question. Uh, Dr. Major is ready for your pet questions. So call in if you have a question or comment this morning. Our phone number is one eight seven seven mpb ring It's one 672 7464 You can email animals at mpbonline.org. Back with more after this. Deep South Dining is the show all about the culture of Southern flavor. From fried chicken and collard greens to shrimp and grits and a glass of sweet tea. Subscribe now to the podcast using any podcast app or download our MPB public media app. We're back on Creature Comforts. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major and Libby Hartfield. And today in studio is our guest, biologist Dr. Kathy Shropshire. We're talking about some of the smaller mammals smaller mammals <laughs> found around the state. And Dr. Major is always ready to take some pet questions. So to join our conversation, give us a phone call. The number is one eight seven seven mpb ring It's one 672 7464. You can email animals at mpbonline.org. Let's start talking about minks in just a few minutes, but we do have a caller on the line, so we say good morning to John, who's called in from Corinth. John, you're on the air with us. Go ahead. Well, hi. Good morning. I'm sorry my uh, uh, topic doesn't concern minks or weasels, but uh, now I, w- I was wondering, I-, I grew up during the 60s, and there was a beetle that was prevalent i mean in memphis and in mississippi it was gold and and silver i'm i'm sorry gold and green and i don't know it's like a half inch long and and my mother used to know about they'd put thread on their leg one of their legs and let them fly around they were real gentle but i haven't are they extinct i mean i haven't seen one and well you know me going on 50 years now. Dr. Major, you're our resident insect expert. Any idea of uh, the beetle that he's talking about? I think you probably have described a June bug. Uh, I haven't seen one lately, uh, but that sounds like it is. And uh, It's been done for years. People would uh, put a string around it, and it would fly around, buzz around it, make a fair amount of noise when it's flying as well. You're correct. I forgot about them being called a June bug. Right. I think that's that's what you saw. I haven't seen any recently, but I'm sure they're still here. I don't think the population has gone away, but we'll just have to see. I'll be on the lookout. You too. All Let right. us know if you see one. <laughs> All right, uh, John. Okay. Thanks very much for that. Thanks. I, I would just imagine how difficult it would be to tie a string around an insect's <laughs> leg, but I don't know. Children well, are amazing. It's, it's, it's pretty good. Pretty good yeah, size. Yeah, no gene bugs. Pretty were good very size compliant. insect. Yeah. Okay. It's, uh, I, I suspect there may have been some legs that went missing in that episode, <laughs> yeah. but uh, yes, they they're pretty large. Yes. All right, got another caller on the line. Let's say good morning to Richard, calling in from Jackson. Good morning, Richard. 
Good morning. Go ahead. Uh, I w- about three or four years ago, uh, I was on Liberty Road in Adams County, about a quarter mile from uh, St. Catherine Creek. The creek was flooding. There had been a lot of rain, and there was a dead badger in the road. I, I, there's no question that it was a badger because Dr. Savant, the local vet whose office is right there, okay, well, stopped we'll at the same time I stopped, and we both saw it and both agreed that it was a badger. Just wondered if maybe it was somebody's pet or I didn't think there were any badgers down here. No, we don't have any re- recorded. So, yeah, it, pro- it probably was somebody's pet because I don't know. They don't occur here, you know, or haven't in, in you know, forever. So, uh, yeah, it must have been somebody's pet. People have a lot of strange things as pets. So. <laughs> He, he may have made it down from Wisconsin. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> that, that, that was my question. Maybe maybe he came down the river and just swam up uh, St. Catherine. No, I don't right. think so. <laughs> They're not real cuddly, so I don't, I'm thinking whoever has him as a pet is really um, brave. <laughs> All right, uh, Richard, thanks for calling in this morning. Uh, we had a caller that suggested uh, that maybe the beetle was a tiger beetle. Uh, does that, uh, do you think that's an idea, possibility, Dr. Major? The true tiger beetles are very interesting. Uh, I, I think they're a good bit smaller than the, than the June bug, uh, one we call June bug. I don't know the scientific name of the June bug, but that's what they were called. The, the tiger beetle, usually those are around a, like a sandy uh around a creek or river they're very fast and they have little holes that if you try to catch one they zip into that hole they're mm. hard to catch i have caught them before and they have some very iridescent colors as well so they they're pretty pretty bright bright insects beetles libby any thoughts um yeah but i've <coughs> tried to catch beetles as a child too and it's very hard to catch a tiger beetle and you're not going to tie a string on their leg. <laughs> <laughs> okay. right. those wonderful iridescent. You know, there there's a a, a a golden beetle that I've seen in South America uh, and then right. supposed to reach it some that brighter gold because I thought about that when he mentioned gold and green. But, you, you know, there are some, some green beetles that are pretty iridescent, too. And I know I remember there was an introduced beetle that for a while gave people problems. And I can't say the name of it right now. Um, somebody may call in for that. But there were, there have um, been some other beetles like that that he might be talking about. But they, they again, look very similar to a June bug. The June bug is the one that we like. Yeah. Maybe talking about the Japanese beetle. Uh, those oh, those things bad. devastate uh, huh? a lot of plants, ornamental plants, especially in the northeast. Mm-hmm. I don't think yeah, we have them here, but they're pretty good size, yes. This is Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. We're visiting today with our guest, Dr. Kathy Shropshire, and we're going to talk about minks. And Kathy, I guess, at least in my mind, most people might think of you know, a mink's coat when we think about a mink. You know, that's interesting. <laughs> Again, when I was telling the, the friend that I was going to do the show, and I said mink, and I said, you know, like mink coat. And they looked, and they thought about it, and then they said, well, I've heard of mink coats, but I never thought about. And she didn't finish, but I know it was where they come from, <laughs> which too often we don't think about where things come from. So, yeah, that's that's mink. <laughs> so um, are they closely related to weasels? Yes. Yeah, in fact, this was something else I learned being out of the system for so long. They've actually changed the genus name for mink and weasels. Um, it was Mustela, and now it's apparently Neogale. They've um, done a lot of research, and you know they have access now to more things that help them determine the scientists determine um, species and that sort of thing. So they actually are, are in a new genus that really comprises North American. Um, species and does not include the European species. So, um, but, and this is one of those things where, you know, we talk about out, out competing. American um, mink have been taken to Europe and for mink farms, huge, huge mink farms. <laughs> and, but, you know, occasionally they do escape. And so they are, the American mink or those that have been in the farms are out competing some of the animals that are there in Europe. So, 
when we start moving these animals around, we really need to consider what could happen. So do we have a lot of minks in Mississippi? Probably more more mink than weasels when you look at trapper reports and those kinds of things. Many more mink were um, were caught than um, or trapped than than um, weasels. And I have seen mink um, over the last few years, you know, in, along the Mississippi River, in fact, in the creek behind my house and out at the reservoir. I've seen some in those rocks along the dam. So, they're again, they're pretty secretive. They um, need those access to water. That's extremely important because most of what they eat are like aquatic animals. And so, you know, they're very secretive. So, again, you're not going to see them until you're in the right kind of habitat. Uh, so living near water, did, are they good swimmers? Oh, yes. Excellent swimmers, yeah. They've got that, well, as I said, kind of a, that otter body, that wiry, sleek, undulating body. And so they're excellent swimmers. And what is their diet? Well, the crayfish is one of the main things they eat, but a lot of fish. They will eat rodents and um, amphibians. They will eat birds. You know, an animal's not going to pass up a meal if they happen to come across it. Now they're going to focus on certain things that they most of their diet is comprised of. But um, so... Um, tadpoles, fish, those kinds of things, too. And then if you would kind of describe the appearance. Um, they're more um, deep brown, brown sable color. Their tail's a little bit darker. But um, if you can imagine an, um, somebody with a mink coat, <laughs> they'll, you know, they've bred mink in captivity to come up with all kinds of shades, you know, silvers and blondes and so forth. And they do have a little bit of a white uh, patch on their chin and maybe down to their chest just a little bit, but pretty much all the same same color. We got a call around the line, so we say good morning to Roger in Florence. Good morning, Roger. You're on the air with us. Well, good morning. Thanks again for your beautiful program. Got to ask Kathy real quick: uh, Was she related to Frank Shropshire? Or <laughs> my, yeah, uh, I, I have to be careful about that. Uh, m- my husband is. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, they're cousins. Yeah. yeah, I think I forgot about that. My, yeah, my dad was dean at the School of Forestry. And yes. About that. Yes. My, okay. My question has to do with assassin bugs. My wife, uh, a couple of years before she passed on, uh, reached up into a hanging plant to pull out some little weeds and was stabbed. And I found a big hole in her finger, and and it swelled up. So I went exploring and found this bug that looked quite a bit like a... uh, hmm, It was a beetle of some kind, and and looked kind of like a real familiar stag beetle, I think. Anyway, it definitely had a long proboscis or something. Gosh, a third of the length of its body. So I looked it up, and it was called an assassin bug. So I'd like for you guys to discuss your experiences with assassin bugs. Uh, Dr. Major, let's start with you. Are you familiar with this one? Yes. Uh, we've had discussions about similar uh, insects. The uh, Reduvidae-type beetle has a fang, if you will call it a fang, it's a very sharp uh, projection, and they can inflict a pretty good wound. I'm sure it, it could swell up. We talked about uh, the fact that they were finding the, they call kissing kissing bugs as well. Uh, the Reduidae beetles uh, can actually spread what's known as Chagas disease, and uh, there are different subsets or different families of those um, that can inflict a wound. This may not have been exactly what what you had looked up, but very similar. Uh, Libby, Libby, what about, or, Libby, you have any experience with assassin bugs? Yes, they are, and they're, I guess, good and bad. I, too, have been stabbed by one, and it, it was pretty painful. But we also had an experience. I um, saw an assassin bug kill a brown recluse spider once. Wow. And there was a little bit of a battle going on there, and they, but the assassin bug did win, which I thought was pretty cool, really. All right. He was there's a, there's kind of another living another, out his name as an assassin, and he did kill <laughs> a spider. There's, there's, there's another bug in that family that uh, is called a wheel bug, 
which if yeah. you look it up, it's really amazing. It's got kind of a ridge across its back, but it also can inflict a wound as well. All right. Yeah, it's strange. Go. Yeah, that, those are pretty, and they are true bugs, hemipteran, and uh, right. They're 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 pretty. They're very good hunters, I guess is what we would say. We are on Creature Comforts today visiting with uh, biologist Dr. Kathy Shropshire talking about uh, weasels and minks. Uh, and, Kathy, you mentioned that uh, especially the weasels are ex- extremely secretive and that we don't know a whole lot about uh, population sizes. So w- when there's an animal like that, w- what do we think about the need for protection or putting on an endangered list or something? How do you go about trying to figure out if they belong there? Right. Well, that's, you know, you you have to make every effort to collect in some way that information so that you have grounds to say, you know, we see a, a reduced population. And, you know, it's really hard. It's it's easy to say we've got something there. It's very difficult to say we don't have a, it's <laughs> something out there. Um, there's always that possibility you're just not at the right place at the right time and that they're there and they're um, – uh, abundant. And that's where things like the Natural Science Museum come in so handy is because, you know, hopefully they are. I have taken a specimen, a weasel specimen to them. And hopefully other people uh, will, you know, ha- take the effort to at least, if they can't give them the specimen, at least give them the information so they can look at, you know, distribution and population and try to, to come up with something. So you, you really got to have good data to show that the population is, you know, you've got kind of anecdotal information at this time. But um, You know, when we talk about declining populations with a lot of wildlife, uh, ha- loss of habitat is, is usually one of the main reasons. Right. Is that something that we should be concerned about with the with, with these creatures? Oh, sure. I mean, anytime you you take out a, a wooded area where that's providing a habitat for their dens and a place to hide and that sort of thing, then, yeah, you're, you're reducing their available habitat. So, you know, if you go along a, a river and creek or whatever and clear off the sides, you've probably damaged habitat that was useful to some of these animals. So, yeah, that's that's got to be one factor for sure. This is Creature Comforts. Time for our last break of the hour. When we get back, we'll continue our visit with Dr. Kathy Shropshire. Also, we've got a caller on the line. It's Nancy. Nancy, if you'd hold on, we'll get to your call right after this break. There's still time for you to call in as well for pet and creature questions answered. The number is one eight seven seven mpb ring Our phone number is one 877 Six seven two seven four six four. You can email animals at mpbonline.org. We'll be back to wrap up the program after this. Hi, I'm Jason Klein from Fix It 101. If you ever thought about changing the doorknob or fixing a leaky faucet, some jobs just aren't that difficult, and yes, you can do it. If you want to find out how to do those things, listen to Fix It 101, podcast everywhere. You're listening to Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major and Libby Hartfield. We've been talking this hour with our guest, wildlife biologist Dr. Kathy Shropshire. Still time to join our conversation. If you act quickly, one eight seven seven MPB ring one eight seven seven six seven two seven four six four is the phone number. We got some calls to get to. I promised Nancy we would take her call after the break, so we are inviting her onto the air. Nancy, good morning. Go ahead, please. Hi, Nancy. Are you with us? Sorry. Sorry, Nancy, we got you on the air now. My bad. Go ahead. Okay. 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 Yeah, I'm excited about this topic because you might be able to solve a mystery. I just, I didn't learn until a few years ago when I took the Master Naturalist class that uh, we had weasels and minks. And I have had a couple of sightings that could be those. Um, Years ago, I was at the Ross Barnett Reservoir uh, at the the, uh, Gila Club, and I thought, that's somebody's. Uh, ferret that he's got now. It's kind of scamper, scampering along the um, riprap on the water line, and but I just saw it really briefly. And then years, a, a few years later, um, on my property in southwest Hunt County, I was driving across a dam on one of my ponds, and there's a couple of more, you know, ferret-looking animals scampering down the uh, down the dam. I think it was pretty early morning, um, and it's unlikely, completely unlikely, that those would be ferrets out here. So, um, and so, I just wondered your thoughts on that. Uh, I think that that sighting um, on my property was probably pretty early morning, and I don't know if they're nocturnal or not. Um, but thoughts. 
Definitely at the reservoir. I've seen them there myself in the rocks. Okay. So I would definitely say. Now, you know, the only other thing that you it could have been was would be an otter. But if you're saying it's ferret size, right. that's more, yeah. you know, that's more mink size. So, and yeah. I live. I see I'll, otters I'll, here. It's way I also live in uh, in South Hines County, and we've had mink behind our house. I whole we had a family. It's okay. been years since I've seen them, so I would think that would be highly likely that that's what okay. you saw. Very cool. So probably mink and not weasel. Yes, the weasels are really. Okay. I mean, they're really small, and to, they can be darker. The ones I've seen here are more of a ta- dark tawny color with that uh-huh. yellow underneath, and it's it's. Fairly obvious, um, so I think. Well, and this just happened so fast, right? And, and I was so shocked. I'm like, whoa, 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 what was that? Right. Uh, and if your impression <laughs> was ferret size, and people kind of, you know, they they've been probably seen or you know know somebody's had ferrets, and so that that's stuck in your mind. So that that sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh-huh. Good to hear from you, Nancy. Thanks for the call. Uh, we had a caller that uh, wasn't able to hold on, and it was Johnny from Mendenhall. And Libby, he was asking about he either had thought he had moles or voles. And again, we've talked about that before. But when you have that type of a creature in your yard, um, any suggestions on control? Well, they're very different, I would say, because the, the vole is eating insects and the moles are eating the roots of your trees. So it, um, he may need to look that up and discern which one he has. Uh, moles make a, a more obvious problem in your yard because they make that mound, you know, it's like, looks like a, a tunnel, but it's the reverse side of it, I guess, almost like a pipe. And uh, they, um, to me, they're much more destructive, although I don't know, I've had a lot of trouble with bowls too. So... Um, I, I, gosh, I'm not sure. No, wait, I, I think I said that backwards. The mole is eating insects and the foal is eating the roots of your tree. But, yeah, so uh, the mole, though, is more obvious. So if he can detect which kind, he may need to get some help to deal with those. Or um, he can, there's, there's a lot of information online how to deal with either one. Okay. It's unfortunate. Maybe he could get a, a weasel because apparently voles are one of the things they really like to eat. So I wish he could get a weasel somehow. Put him down that tunnel. Yeah, I'll put him down the tunnel. Um, Kathy, only got about a half a minute left. Are there any other uh, small mammals that uh, people might be noticing maybe more in abundance uh, as we move into spring and summer? Oh, goodness. Oh, goodness. I'm trying to think what's coming out of uh, spring. Well, you know, <laughs> the rat. We saw my dog and I saw a rabbit yesterday. We we jumped the rabbit uh, yesterday out of the out of the wood pile. So she really wanted to go in and t- investigate that wood pile. And I thought, no, well, there might be babies in there. It's a little early, but no, we do not need to go and investigate the wood pile. <laughs> Alrighty, that's going to wrap us up for today. Creature Comforts is a production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting Think Radio, funded, provided in part by listeners. To hear today's show or a previous show, you can visit creaturecomforts.mpbonline.org. Our show is produced by Jabba Chapman, and our call screener today was Liz Gill. So for Dr. Troy Major, Libby Hartfield, and our guest, Dr. Kathy Shropshire, I'm Kevin Farrell, inviting you to stay tuned. Up next, it's AutoCorrect. We'll be back next Thursday at 9 for Creature Comforts, heard only on MPB Think Radio.